and it was just like mind blow, right? Like everything I ever needed to know is right there. Why didn't you tell me? You know, it's like freaking out. Uh, but there's been certain truths along the way that have really arrested me. You know, like when I read them, they arrested me. And uh, I remember when I first uh, was like pursuing Jesus, like trying to figure out who he was and all that stuff. Because I'm, like I said, I'm a Jewish kid, right? So you're not supposed to talk about Jesus. That's the voodoo that you do so well, right? You don't talk about him. And so when I started to think about maybe this Jesus and I picked up a Bible, uh, there were certain things that I read and it just really floored me, right? Um, one of them was John 10, 10. Uh, the enemy came to steal, kill, and destroy. I was all about his program. I thought I was doing well, but I wasn't. And, and, but then the verse goes on to say, but Jesus came that you might have life in abundance. And I was like, well, wait a minute. I, I thought I had life in abundance because I had all the stuff that an American young man should have. I'm not going to go down the list because I don't want to glamorize or glorify sin in any way. But, but, but I had all that, and I realized I didn't have anything to do with Jesus, but there was obviously something better available that I never had. So I was like, man, so in other words, my life doesn't have to suck? Wow, that's like amazing, right? So that was one. The other one that just absolutely floored me, and it's still hard for me to even read it, but I want to share it with you. And I don't know if it'll arrest your heart like it did to mine, but it changed my forever. How many people agree that God the Father would love God the Son, Jesus? Would you agree? Like totally love him, right? That like his favorite thing in all of the universe would be his son, Jesus. Would you guys all agree to that? Okay, awesome. Well, I agree too. And I kind of understood that God the Father would love God the Son, and I also understand that he supposedly loved me, right? Because for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, right? He loved the world. He loved people like me who were a train wreck, but he still loved me. But then there's, you know, the love that he has for me, but then there's the love that he has for Jesus, right? The Trinity. I'm not in the Trinity. So I thought that there was this, like, massive thing right here, right? So I was appreciative of the love that he had for me, but I had no idea it was like this. John 17, 23, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, speaking to his Father in prayer about you and I. He says this in verse 23. I am in them. He's talking to his Father, the Father in heaven. I am in them. You are in me. May they experience such perfect unity, us, that two things would happen. That the world would know that you sent me so they would see us and realize that Jesus is real and that he came from heaven because of us. That's big, right? But then this is the thing that crushed me. Will they experience such perfect unity so that the world will know that you love them as much as you love me? That's freaking crazy, right? And that's what made me fall in love with God. That verse wrecked me, and I've never been the same since. But like all of us, we're all in different stages and, and seasons of our walk with God. Somebody in this room might not have any relationship with God at all. And if that's you, I'm super happy that you're here. Maybe you've been walking with him and love him, and, and you've been doing it for 30, 40, 50 years, and that's awesome. But we all have seasons of our life, right? And so when I was getting to know Jesus, that, those verses kind of began to crush me and shape who I was. And because of that great love that he had for me, I got sucked into his whole thing, his program, right? And I got sucked into church, and I felt like, Man, I feel called to serve him. Like this great love that he has for me is making me want to do something about it, right? I can't just be quiet anymore. It's like floored my life, and I have to share this with people. And so I sense this tractor beam, right? This sucking in of, of my life into ministry. Like I need to make this the priority of my life to tell people about him. And, and so... In that period of my life, when I got sucked into ministry, uh, some other verses floored me. I want to share them with you. Um, 1 Peter 5, 2 is a big, big, big one. It still rings so very loudly in my ear, even tonight. And it says, 
to care for the flock that God has entrusted you. Some translations would say feed the flock. Some translations would say shepherd the flock. Care for the flock that God has entrusted to you. Watch over it willingly, not grudgingly. Pause. I've struggled with that. Just transparent like this times. I want to run, right? And I'm not really wanting to do it willingly because it's like, it's not easy to open your heart to someone and love them and let them in only to have them turn and, right? Because sheep bite, right? Don't they bite? They bite. And there are wolves in the sheep and they're, they're, they're intentionally trying to hurt, but there's sheep that aren't trying to hurt, but they bite. And so sometimes you don't really want to come back up here and do it willingly. Monday morning comes quick and you're like, man, I don't know. So I struggle with that. But he says, care for the flock that God has entrusted to you. Watch over it willingly, not grudgingly, not for what you will get out of it. You just don't get much out of ministry. You know, like you, you really don't. For as many people as admire you and love you as those that are naysayers and bite you. And, and they, 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 they rip you down and they, and, and they, they, you know, most preachers aren't Joel Osteen making $100 million. Most guys are like me making nothing and they're just doing it because of this next part of the verse where he says, but do it because you're eager to serve God. It's not to do it for the rewards because there's not many. You do it because you're eager to serve God. When I sensed that incredible love he had for me, I could not keep my mouth closed. I'm eager to serve you. Like, I need to get the word out, right? And his ministry to me, clear as day. Tell people about me, use that book. That was it. That's all I've, that's the only audible voice ever from Jesus that I've gotten. Tell people about me, use the book. And so I've decided to obey that. And to do that the best that I can. And it's because I'm eager to serve him. I'd like to tell you, because you might want to hear it more, that I do it because, Aaron, I love you. That's why, right? That'd be so super nice, but it's not the truth. The truth is, the reason why I keep coming back for more and more sheep biting is because I'm eager to serve God because of his great love for me. Kind of like Paul, a couple, was it last week or the week before? What was his great motivation to continue on? God's great love for him. Christ's love compels me. And that's why we do it. It's not for what I can gain. Everybody likes an attaboy, but that's not why we do it. We do it because we're eager to serve God. And so that, that verse continues to shape my every day of everything that I'm doing. And then it got worse. Okay, as if that's not enough, it got worse. Hebrews 13, 17, I came to tenaciously read my Bible, right? And as I'm sucked into ministry now, I'm like, I'm like been given some folks to look after, right? And then I read this, obey your spiritual leaders. Well, pride would say, that's right, you better. They're going to listen to me. <laughs> you better listen to me, right? Pride would do that. But that pride that would swell up in a man is immediately going to evaporate over these next words. Watch this. And do what they say. Their work is to watch over your souls, and they are accountable to God. Who really, I mean, who really wants to be a pastor, right? Who really wants to be a pastor? Is it worth it? Is it all the accolades and the, everyone's attaboys that you do it for? You're, you're, someday I'm going to look into the eyes of Christ and give an account for what I'm saying to you right now. You will not have to give an account for what you said to me. I will. Like nobody wants this job unless you are eager to serve the Lord because of the love that he showed for you. And so I, I, I have been trying for years now to just faithfully follow this mandate of carefully watching over the flock that he has entrusted to me, and all the while knowing the weight that is on that, that one day I'm going to stare into the piercing eyes of the one that created me and explain every single thing I ever said to you. That's a crushing weight. But I want to, I want to do this, and I want to do it well, the best that I can, as faithful as I can, 
for as long as I can, okay? So I'm going to try to do that here tonight with you. I want to start off by um, um, letting you know about a quote that I love. Um, it's a guy named A.W. Tozer, right? Good one. Tozer once said this, that what comes to your mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. Do you agree? Would you agree with that? You'd agree? Would you agree? What pops into your mind, what comes to mind when you, wow, you got that up there. What comes to your mind when you think of God is the most important thing about you. I don't know if everyone would agree with that, right? I mean, you might disagree. You might pick apart the minutia of what's being said there and maybe come up with something different or maybe a different way to express that. Um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't argue with that actually at all. I personally believe that what you think about this, you know, this is bold, it is, um, but, but what you think, your own personal thoughts and perspective and belief about God, it, it determines your identity, Right? One, it, it determines your identity because, you know, the scriptures would say um, that, that all of us are God's creation, but not all of us are God's kids. Right? Those who believe in Christ have been given the privilege of being called the sons and daughters of God. So, so we have to understand this about what God has decided. Um, it also, your, your thoughts, your perspectives, your beliefs, they also uh, define your purpose. So, so before I became a Christian, right, my purpose was not unique in any way. I was a typical young American guy. And what's your purpose when you're a typical young American guy? Get a good education, get a good job, keep your nose clean, make some money, have a wife, have a house, have a mortgage, right? Work hard, Protestant work ethic, go on vacation, save up some money, and go to the villages and die. And we laugh, is that not America? But when you realize that God created you in his image to be like him, and he saved you for this ultimate goal, to worship him. Colossians 1.16, everything was created by him and his purpose for him. It's redefining your purpose, Right? And when you understand that you've been saved to spread his kingdom to the ends of the earth, that it's beyond your nine to five and having a few kids and having a mortgage and having a car and making some money, that changes your purpose, right? So it, 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 it determines your identity, it defines your purpose, and it also decides your destiny. Let's just make this really, really cut and dry. Uh, heaven, hell. See, what you think about God is, is what determines that, right? Because it doesn't determine who he is. It determines who you are and where you're going, right? That's, so, so I think that this bold statement that Tozer made, I think he's actually um, pretty accurate. I think that, that knowing God, this perspective of your own person, um, it, it answers the biggest questions that the human race has. You know, uh, where did I come from? Why am I here? What's my purpose? And what happens after my quick, quick, Life ends. Like the scriptures say that, that your life is but a vapor, right? Did you ever cook up some ramen noodles? Say you don't. You live in Lake County. You eat at least twice a week. Come on now, right? You see the steam coming up, right? And it comes up and just gone. That's what God says about your life. And listen, if you're like me, right, you feel it. I feel it. I get up in the morning out of my bed, and it's not the same as it used to be, right? You get up. It's not just spring up anymore, is it? You got to slide to the edge once or twice, right? And then it's like this. And we all have it. Don't make fun of me. Right? So yesterday I was riding around with my buddies in his Ford Bronco 2 drinking Bush Light and listening to Bon Jovi. And today I have two grandkids. Like a vapor, yo. Right? Like a vapor. That's how quick life goes. And understanding who God is gives you um, identity and purpose, and it changes your, ident and it changes your destiny, okay? Um, and I feel it big time. I feel it big time. Um, today, I want to help you establish this most important thing about you. And, it, and, and it's not by telling you what you should think at all. It's by informing you about what God has to say 
about how to figure out who he is and what he expects and what he does and how he thinks and so on. And in so doing this gathering of information and the proper way to do it, it will begin to form who you are and how you live your life and how you will spend eternity, okay? So when I'm doing this, inspired by last week's message where it says, don't just merely say that you love people, show it, right? Show that you love them. So listen, I could go out and I could buy you lunch, right? That's nice. Is that love? Certainly love. Your car breaks down, I could pay to have it fixed. Is that love? Should we do those things, Christians? Absolutely. But what's the greatest gift? What's the greatest show of love is to actually give someone the, the information they need to change their eternal destiny and purpose. That's the greatest gift you could give somebody. And I want to help you do that here tonight by studying God's word. Okay? So, let's, let's do this. Just think about this for a second. If God's word is true, and I believe that it is, then, then studying it and, and learning who God is. Forget this book for a second. How about just learning who God is? Because if that's true, what pops into your mind when you think about God as the most important thing about you, then it's going to determine how you, the purpose and the way that you live the rest of your life, right? Not just today or tomorrow, like the rest of your life and the next 100 years and the next 500 years and the next thousand years and a million years. And, and I'm just saying those numbers because if I say eternity, our brains can't handle that because we don't understand what that is. But that's the truth. Understanding who God is is going to change your eternity. And so it's super, super important, right? Super important. And I want you to get this. This is super important here tonight. Okay, and I'm not going to preach to you and tell you what to believe at all. I'm just going to share with you what God's Word says about how to find out who He is. And so I'm just going to say that this, this message here, it's, it, it isn't going to be a hooray, woo, God message that's going to make you dance around praising all over the sanctuary. But it is a message that, was, that will help you establish a belief and establish a theology. It'll help you establish a way to spiritually form yourself so that, that inevitably you will end up dancing. Because I'm believing that when you really know who God is, only one thing happens, it's worship. When you know God for who He really is and what He's done for you, you will do nothing but worship Him. And so that's what I want to help us do here tonight by the, with the help, of course, of God's spirit and his precious word. So please do me a favor and open your Bibles to 1 John chapter 4. We're continuing our message series called Need to Know. We need to know some things, right? We need to know some things because he said we're supposed to worship him in spirit and in truth. Spirit is your job. Truth is his. Okay? But it's your job to glean it. It's your job to dig it out of the mind and find out who God really is and how he really wants you to worship him. So, 1 John chapter 4, I'm going to read verses 1 through 6. And we're going to see here how God uses John to warn us, because this, this letter, remember, this letter is written to believers, right? This is an evangelistic letter telling you how to get saved. He's writing to believers, followers of Christ, and he's giving us some warnings to the disciples, to us, about where to get our information from, right? And isn't it the job of the pastor, isn't it the job of the shepherd to, to just lead his sheep to the greenest pastures? Isn't that what he's supposed to do? And isn't that the job of, of, of the Apostle John? And isn't that my job? And isn't it ultimately the job of the senior pastor, the lead shepherd, Jesus Christ, leading his, his flock through his under shepherds to the greenest of pastors. And so that's where we are here. You ready for me to read? Are you there? Do you guys all have a copy of God's word in your hand? Okay. Dear friends, do not believe everyone who claims to speak by the Spirit. You must test them to see if the Spirit they have comes from God. For there are many false prophets in the world. This is how we know if, we ha if they have the Spirit of God. 
And he gives one of the ways right here. If a person claiming to be a prophet, and we'll talk about this for a moment, and it's just really someone who's speaking for God. It's that person he refers to earlier about speaking by the Spirit, you know? So if anyone claims to be that man or that woman, they acknowledge that Jesus came in a real body, that person as the Spirit of God. But if someone claims to be that prophet, you know, the one who's speaking by the Spirit, and does not acknowledge the truth about Jesus, now that's, that's a big statement, because right? there's lots of truths about Jesus, isn't there? There's lots of truth, and that would, that would really indicate to the reader that there's some digging to do, because if you want to find out the truth about Jesus, you're not going to find it in this one sentence. Right? Jesus said, you search the scriptures day and night looking for everlasting life, when all the while they all point to me. Right? So, so, so you, if you need to know the truth about Jesus, you ain't gleaning it from this one sentence. Okay? So it's obvious that there's more to being a, a prophet, one who speaks by the Spirit, more than just acknowledging that he came in a real body. That, that's one thing, but there's the truth about Jesus. That's a lot. Um, and if they do not acknowledge the truth about Jesus. That person is not from God. Such a person is the spirit of the Antichrist, which is just anyone or anything that would oppose the person and work of Jesus by definition, okay? Um, that person is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard is coming into the world and indeed is already here. But you belong to God, my dear children. You have already won a victory over those people because the spirit who lives in you is greater than the spirit who lives in the world. Those people belong to this world, so they speak from the world's viewpoint. And the world listens to them. But we belong to God, and those who know God listen to us. When I say us, can I just do this? Right here. This, this is John writing, right? He's one of Jesus' disciples, one of his apostles, right? He's, so when he says, us, he's not just talking about himself, right? Who would he be talking about? Uh, Peter, right? John, Matthew, all these guys, right? All these authors of these letters, right? These were the, these were the, the original gangsters, right? The ones who were hanging with Jesus. That he's not the only one who wrote a book, right? So all these guys, they, and, and we, by God's grace, right, and, and our privilege, it's been preserved for us. It's right here, right? And so the difference is that the people of the world would listen to the people of the world, but God's real kids, they listen to this. They listen to this, okay? Um, but we belong to God, and those who know God listen to us. If they do not belong to God, they do not listen to, look, us. That is how we know if someone has the spirit of truth or the spirit of deception. Okay, so here's the warning. You see it there. It's right there in the text. I'm not making anybody, anything up. Don't believe everyone. Just don't believe everyone. There's so many experts out there, right? You know, I, I, I'm, I'm 50 now, and so I'm getting there, man. <laughs> Ugh, I'm bad in the morning, right? But I'm not super old, but... At the, very end, at the very beginning of my life was the end of a TV era that I vaguely remember. Some of you are older than me. You're going to remember it well. When there was a select few credible men that would report the news accurately. Guys like Walter Cronkite. Remember that guy? Right? He would, like, there wasn't a lot of, I, I've watched some of his stuff, not a lot of opinion. He would just get up at his desk and he'd say, hey, this happened. Let's move on to the next story. And this happened, right? And, that, and that's what, it was credible. He didn't put his opinion in it. It was just like, here's what happened. You figure it out, right? I know, I'm sure he had an opinion, right? Everybody has an opinion. And I'm sure he had an opinion, but he just didn't make it a practice of expressing his opinion. He just said, hey, here's the facts. You decide. I want to try to do that. That's what I try to do. And, and, and so, but now, right, we're in 2019. It's a whole different world. Right? It's totally different now. Like, everyone has a blog. And everyone has, like, a vlog, right? A video blog where, and, 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 and they, or they have a YouTube channel, right? And, 
And with t modern technology, with all these website companies and templates and YouTube channels, like you can, it's already been kind of made for you. You just kind of pick it and it produces this incredibly professional looking website or YouTube channel that looks so professional and real that it's hard to decipher between the good and the right and the legit, be between that and the, the, the bitter, angry 20-something who's still living in his mom's basement who wants his voice to be heard. And they look the same, right? And what John is saying here is that like in the spiritual world, in the, in the faith world, it's kind of like that as well. That there, you know, that there's, and I say this with all quotes, that there's, um, there's reporters and there's messengers and there's mouthpieces and his, you know, his prophets and they're not legit. They're just not legit. That's why it says, like, don't just believe everyone who claims to speak by the Spirit, he says, for there are many false prophets in the world. And, and that's still true now, and probably more so now, because now, and I, listen, I, I'm doing this vocationally, so this is my everything. And it's not a day that goes by that I have people in this church that come to me and say, hey, did, did you listen to this guy? Did you listen to this guy? And, and the rapture reports and the revelation reports and the, and the this guy and that guy and this guy and this guy. And I'm just waiting for one of them to quote something from the Bible, for goodness sakes, instead of all these authors. And this is where they're getting their revelation from all these people. It's so much of it. And it's so prevalent because you can just get on your smartphone and it's endless ministries and, and, and pastors and teachers and Everyone, and, and he's saying, listen, don't believe everyone who claims to speak by the Spirit. God's prophets were the ones who would, would uh, these, are the, these are the thus saith the Lord guys, right? Like, they, they would give a, they would foretell of something to come. They would, they would, they would, um, Sometimes it would be a warning, right? It was a stern uh, warning that not all people that speak for God are actually God's spokesmen. A true prophet, listen, this is biblical. You can look this stuff up. A, a true prophet of God would, would get a direct, listen, new, like this is not something from the Bible because these guys didn't have the Bible yet. Right, guys like Hosea and Isaiah and all these guys, they didn't, right? So when they're getting stuff, it was a new, either a verbal or a vision that God wanted to give them so that it was designed to be given to a specific audience, like a people group or a nation. And he would, start, and you can look these things up because you'd see at the beginning of these prophetic books in the Bible, it would say that, so-and-so, Malachi and, and Habakkuk and Nahum and Obadiah received this message from the Lord. And then it would be in quotes, like, this is exactly what God said. They, they would hear it. This is it. Or it would say that it came in a vision and then there was no quotes. See how accurate the word of God is? When it's spoken, you'll see it listed in quotes. When it's not spoken, it comes as a vision. It's never quoted. I saw it. I'm going to do the best I can to give it, right? But it was something new for these people. Now, a few months ago in one of my sermons, I shared with you Old Testament scriptures, scripture after scripture, describing to you the, the legitimacy of a prophet as God would see it. And it's summed up like this. If, if someone claims to be a prophet, like speaking from me, he's always going to be correct, right? Because if it's coming from the Lord, it's always going to be accurate. So if he predicts, hey, this, this Bible is going to fall off this table tomorrow at 2 o'clock. If it doesn't, all those verses are summed up this way. If what he says doesn't come true, he is not a man to be feared. You don't listen to him. He's not from me, Okay. So, so you have to be careful. Not all people that are speaking by the Spirit are actually speaking by the Spirit, okay? They might think they are, but they're not all. Now listen, I want to tell you something. I am not a prophet. I never claim to be. I never will be, most likely. <laughs> 
I am a man with a prophetic ministry. Okay, there's a difference there, okay? I'm a pastor. I'm a pastor, not a prophet. I'm a pastor with a prophetic ministry. That means I'm a pastor that proclaims what God says. Okay? That means I'm not looking for something new. I'm proclaiming to you something true. That's what I'm doing. I'm not hearing anything new from God. I don't need new revelation. Okay? God has declared to the world who he is through his book. And so my job is to faithfully tell you what God has said. That's what a prophetic ministry does. Okay? So, back to the text here. It talks about validity of someone who would speak by the Spirit. Let's just, let's just check, our, check them out right here. 1 John 4, 2, right? 1 John 4, 2. It says, this is how we know if they have the Spirit of God. If a person claiming to be that that person speaking by the Spirit, the prophet, acknowledges that Jesus Christ came in a real body. That person has the Spirit of God. Okay, that's awesome. That's one. That's the incarnation. Okay? Not everybody believes in the incarnation, that, the, that God became a person. There are other groups of people, such as, and I'm not ripping them, but such as like the Jehovah's Witness, and God loves those people, and we should love those people, and we should even admire their tenacity and their, their bold approach to evangelizing, right? But, but they would claim something different. They wouldn't acknowledge this. They would acknowledge that God's ultimate plan was the creation of Jesus, not the incarnation of Jesus. Do you understand? God is not a, Jesus is not a created being. Colossians chapter 1 clearly defines this for us, that he, Christ, is the creator of heaven and earth. Okay? And when God spoke the planets into existence, it was Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, who opened his mouth and out came the planets at 180,000 miles per second. That's who Jesus Christ is. It's the incarnation. It's God becoming man. Okay, that's the first one. You can't deny that and still say you're, you're speaking for the Lord. Okay, 1 John 4, 14, go there, is another test of validity. Furthermore, we have seen with our own eyes and now testify that the Father sent His Son. No, that's not it. 15, it's 4, 415, I'm sorry. All who confess that Jesus is the Son of God have God living in them, and they live in God, okay? So if someone is speaking of, for God, they must agree and be able to say that Jesus Christ is not some created being, but the actual second person, the Son of God. When, when, when Jesus asked Peter, who do they say that I am? He gave me answers, but then he said, no, who do you say that I am? He said, you're the anointed one, the Messiah, the son of the living God. A person who speaks for, for God must be able to believe that and say it. Amen? Okay, here's the third one. It's in 1 Corinthians 12, 3. Um, anyone who's living by the Spirit can't curse Jesus. They can't. They can't. Okay? They can't curse Jesus. And it also says that only those that are living by the Spirit can say that Jesus is Lord. Now, please understand, you can go up to a stone-cold atheist and say, hey, buddy, I know you don't believe this, but just say Jesus is Lord. He'll look you right in the face and say, Jesus is Lord. Okay, so that's not what it means here. It doesn't mean that they just they can't spit it out. Like, that's not what they're saying here, right? It means I, I can't say that Jesus is truly my Lord except if I've been indwelled by the Holy Spirit of God. Okay, so that's another test for validity. And here's the fourth one. A false voice speaks worldly things. Look here, uh, 1 John 4, 5. Those people belong to this world, so they speak from the world's viewpoint. And the world listens to them. You know what the world is? Unsaved people. Right? Unsaved people. And I'm not the one who pulls the verdict on people to decide whether they're saved or not. But I'm just telling you right here. It says that the people who are preaching things of the world, those people belong to the world. So they speak from the world's viewpoint and the world listens to them. Um, 
Notice, though, notice, I noticed this when I was reading it. Uh, nowhere in the text does it say that they're evil. Does it? It doesn't say that they're evil. Now, there are parts of the scriptures where it says that like evil people worm their way into the church, like there's intention there, right? But here in this text, it never says anything about evil. It says that they just teach wrong. And so, see, I want to be careful because I'm not, the, like I said, I'm not the one who puts the gavel down on who's right and who's wrong. But I would just say this, just from my own hope for something better, I think that there are people that deliberately are evil. They've been assigned by the devil to come and try to crush Christianity. Like, I, they're, they're evil and intentionally trying to do that. Like, I get that. But I want to believe greater things concerning people. And so I just want to say that those that are teaching incorrectly, you know, I just want to hope that they didn't, they're not really trying, right? I just think that maybe they're just a little off, right? Can't we all, can't we just be off? Can't we all read something and just not see it? I, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm that guy. Like, I've, I've stood before you guys hundreds of times now and told you, like, read your Bible because I might be wrong. Can't we all just admit that we're all wrong? That there's things that we just don't know? I mean, nobody in this world can read that entire book and have it down pat, bat in a thousand. It's not happening, right? We're all a little bit wrong about some stuff. So I just want to believe that there's some false teachers out there that, you know, at one point they're just like me. They had the God telling, hey, listen, I want you to go tell people about me. Man, I love you and I love them and they're dying and just go tell them. And they're like, yes, I'll do that, Lord, anything. Here I am, send me. And then they just kind of get off course, right? They get into a church that teaches something that might be not right, and you're just immersed in there long enough, and it just becomes part of your denominational bent, right? I mean, J Pastor Jay, he was like that for years and years. He was like the Southern Baptist of Southern. He said, I even had papers. I was full breed. <coughs> and he was just sitting there, and he's listening, and, he, and he's, got, he's a student of the Word of God. You guys all know this, right? And he's reading his Bible while the preachers are up there preaching, and he's like, and he was much like me because I was doing that too. He's like, what you talking about, Willis? Right? <laughs> That's not what it says. It doesn't say that at all, right? Those who persevere to the end prove that they're saved. Wait, 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 hold on a second. Jesus said, those who endure to the end shall be saved. Twisty, twisty, twisty tree. Right? What is that? And so isn't that true for all of us? Can we all get in that a little bit? Just get under some teaching for a long enough time that maybe we just get a little off. Some are intentionally evil, trying to disrupt the work of God, but some are just off because they've been in something so long, they're entrenched in that river, and it's flowing fast, and they just can't get out. Right? <clears throat> so they just don't acknowledge the truth about Jesus, and it's not because they don't know they just been misinformed. It's not, I'm, I'm sorry, they don't know. They, 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 do, they don't know. They've been misinformed. And I think all of us can kind of fall into that. He's talking very much about the things of this world. Those people belong to this world, so they speak from the world's viewpoint, and the world listens to them. Teaching things that make your life better, health and wealth and authority and power and comfort and ease. Certainly this is American, but not necessarily Christianity, right? Let me look back at, do me a favor, turn back one page and let's go back to a place we've already been. Look at 1 John chapter 2, look at verses 15 through 17. You can't, notice, can't help but notice this whole idea of the world. And look what he says there. Do not love this world, nor the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. Like, yikes, right? For the world. Okay, here's what the world is. The world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, craving for everything we see. Man, it sounds like America and pride in our achievements and possessions. 
right? Gathering up of stuff and wealth and power and influence and, and comfort and ease and bubble wrapping our life so we don't have any pain or suffering in any way, right? That's what we do. He said, these are not from the Father, but are from this world. And this world is fading away along with everything that people crave. You see the word that's used there? Cravings. It's like animalistic. It's not of God. He says it's not of God. To crave these things. Is it nice to have a decent car? Is it? Yes. But to crave it, right? That's not good. That's not healthy. But anyone who does the will, does what, what pleases God, will live forever. See, so much of this stuff of, of gaining and having and, and acquiring and authority and power and comfort and ease, right? It's so much of it is being taught in churches all over the world. And it's popular because it plays off of your cravings. It, cra it plays off of your natural desires to crave stuff. And so when you come to the pulpit and you say, listen, all that stuff that you're craving is available in Christ, you're like, yes, where do I sign up? And that's what happens in churches all the time. Constantly, I see it all the time. See, there's a big difference between like, the obedience to God's word and the prompting of God's spirit and the cravings of the flesh. It's a big difference between the two. There's a chasm there. Think about the temptation of Jesus Christ himself. He gets baptized. He goes out into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And three times the devil himself comes to Jesus, who is man, right? He's a man just like you and I. He's deity, but he's a man. And the devil tries to tempt his cravings, his fleshy cravings, three different times. He tries to go tempt him with worldly fame and power and gain and wealth and authority. And listen, if you read it, he even uses Bible verses to tempt Jesus. And that's what goes on in church all the time. Jesus said no to all of his offers for these things. Now think about that. In churches, it's, it's taught all the time. Like if you give, you'll get and... You want to break the chains of poverty? And, 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 and the devil offers Jesus, the man, all this great power and influence and gain. And, and Jesus says, no, to all of it. The devil loves to give people what they want. And so God's people, his spokesmen, don't need to help him. Okay? That's not what we're called to do. Can God bless his people financially? Yes, he can. Absolutely. Can, God's, can God bless his people with healing? Yes, he can. Can God bless his people with comfort? He can and he does. But, right? Anytime you hear the word but in church, something's coming. There's a shift coming, right? So he can do all those things, and I agree 100%. But, John 16, 33, in this life you will have many trials and sorrows. So can he deliver you? Can he, can he help you? Can he bless you? Yes, but not to the exclusion of the trials and sorrows. Romans 8, 17. We are his children. That's a good place for an amen. Right? And we are his heirs. Together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But, oh, here it comes again. But if we share his glory, we must also share his suffering. 1 Peter 4.13, we are told, listen, we are told to rejoice as you participate in the sufferings of Christ. Listen, <laughs> rejoice in is not the same as pray it away, pray it away, pray it away. And that's what churches are doing. Pray it away, pray it away, pray it away. Rebuke it with all the rebuking you have. When all the while the Bible's saying, hey, listen, rejoice in your suffering. Paul, who's crazy, Philippians 3.10, I want to suffer with Christ. What? Tell that to the prosperity guy 
who says God wants to have all this stuff for you and give you all this stuff. And Paul's like, no, I don't even want that stuff. Get it away from me, man. I want to suffer with Christ. Christianity isn't the removal of all discomfort and the gathering of wealth, health, and power. So don't believe everyone, okay? Now what I'm talking to you about is if there are people that are teaching and preaching this stuff, then you need to discount all the other stuff that they're talking about. It would disqualify someone as being a spokesman for the Spirit. Do you understand what I'm saying? So I'm not telling you what to believe here. I'm just saying this is not biblical. Listen, if breaking, I mentioned this, if breaking the chains of poverty were somehow the goal of our Christian faith, why did all the apostles have nothing? Why were they getting beaten and persecuted and jailed and martyred for their faith? Why did Jesus himself say that I don't even have a place to lay my head? How does that happen? Jesus was so poor as a man that when it came time to pay his taxes, and Peter said, what should we do? What did he do? He didn't go... You know, hold on a second. I mean, he's God, right? You guys agree that he's God? You agree that he's God. I know you agree he's God, right? So do you think he could have pulled a dime out of his pocket? Total, right? But why didn't he? What did he say? I got nothing. Right? So this is what I need you to do, Peter. I need you to go down to the lake. I want you to go fishing. And the first fish that you catch, look in its mouth. There's going to be a coin in there. Go pay our taxes with that. I mean, that's sovereignty over creation right there, right? So that's cool, right? But why didn't Jesus just go like this? Pull out his wallet. Like, why didn't he, right? He didn't have any money. If he had money, he would have just given it to him, right? He didn't have any money. He said, go down there and do this. Why did he do that? If wealth and breaking the chains of poverty is a Christian virtue or goal, why didn't Jesus just say, pray? just ask me and I'll give you the money to pay your taxes? Why didn't he just pull it out and say, guys, just... Speak life, man. Why didn't he do that? Because he wants us always to be dependent on him. Right? Go fish and find a coin in his mouth. Definitely could have pulled a quarter out of his pocket, but he didn't. Because he wants us to be dependent upon him all the time. Right? All the time. <clears throat> do me a favor. I want to beat this horse. I want you to turn to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. I'm going to read something with you. We're talking about who you should listen to. Okay? Who you should listen to. And I, listen, I, I don't think, let me just say this, I don't think that I'm the only guy you should be listening to. Okay? I listen to guys. I listen to uh, James McDonald, Matt Chandler, Crawford Loritz. I listen to those guys. But I don't go all over the world listening to every single person that has a book. You know, they have a book and they say, hey, hey, let me ask you. Um, they're, they're explaining this thing, right? And what, they're, what they want to say is, hey, you know, because in ancient Israel, what they used to do is this, 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 and this. And you're like, oh, that's cool. Yeah, prove it. Like, how do we know? But they sound like experts, right? Because they have a book. Or they stand up and they have a microphone. Or they have a YouTube channel. They, right? they look like they have authority. But the, what he's saying here is like, don't just listen to everybody. Right? Your eternity's at stake. right? So, so listen to this. This is awesome. This is Paul writing to the church in Corinth. And he says, he's talking about we. So again, a lot of times these apostles wouldn't just write about themselves. He's, they're talking about the whole gang of guys. right? These, these early guys. He says, we live in such a way that no one will stumble because of us. So in other words, everything they do, that's a bold statement. Everyone always says, well, there's no perfect church. He kind of had one here, right? I don't do anything wrong. But I, I believe it. You know, it's in the Bible. So I'm believing he did everything right. He says, I don't do anything that's going to cause them to stumble. And no one will find fault with our ministry. So we got a, they got a rocking thing going here. Would you agree, right? Uh, in everything we do, we show that we are true ministers of God. So totally spot-on ministry going on here. You guys all agree, right? Now watch this. 
We patiently endure troubles and hardships and calamities of every kind. We have been beaten, put in prison, faced angry mobs, worked to exhaustion, endured, that means lengths, sleepless nights, and gone without food. We prove ourselves by our purity, our understanding, our patience, our kindness by the Holy Spirit within us and by our sincere love. So wait, 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 wait. I'm a little confused because the, the, these, 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 these guys that are spe- and women are, that are speaking for the Lord all the time and speak life and, 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 and gain and break the chains of poverty and all stuff. Why didn't he do that? Like he says the thing that makes us real is, 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 is what? Uh, the money and overcoming all that? No, 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 no. Um, our purity, our understanding, our patience, our kindness, and our love. Oh, and, and we preach the truth. God's power is working in us. So, so you can see that the deliverance of money and power and authority and gain, like that is not proof of God working. Because this guy, Paul, said he didn't have any of that. But God's power was working here. We use the weapons of righteousness in the right hand for attack and the left hand for defense. We serve God whether people honor us or despise us, whether they slander us or praise us. We are honest, but they call us imposters. We are ignored even though we're well known. We live close to death, but we are still alive. We have been beaten, but we have not been killed. Our hearts ache, but we, have, oh, we always have joy. We are poor, but we, have, but we give spiritual riches to others. We own nothing, yet we have everything. These guys failed in every human metric you could measure. They were absolute bust in everything, yet they are our perfect, it says here, they're our perfect example of true ministry. They had nothing. They said they were poor and we own nothing. And, we're, and we have people claim, name it, claim it, believe it, speak it into existence. Why didn't they? Why didn't they? Did they somehow miss this thing? The apostles who are teaching us this, did they miss this part that they could do that? I don't know, man. These are authentic Christ followers, and they said they were hungry, poor, and owned nothing. Would you do me a favor and go backwards just a little bit to the book of Romans? Because I want you to see it's not an isolated incident. Paul again, Romans chapter 8. 35 through 37. You know, we never want to pull, you know, we want to form a doctrine uh, out of like one verse, one little section. It should be kind of um, ongoing through Scripture if we're going to believe it as, as, a, as a doctrine we can stake our life on, right? So Romans chapter 8, 35 through 37. Can, it, can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? question he asks rhetorical but it's there Um, does it mean he no longer loves us if we have listen trouble calamity persecuted hunger destitute in danger threatened with death (laughs) as the scriptures say for your sake we are killed every day we're being slaughtered like sheep So look up a bunch of different translations. Trouble, this is what they had. Calamity, persecution, hunger, death. You know what destitute even means? I didn't even know what it really meant. So I looked it up, right? That's what we should do. It means without basic necessities, penniless, impoverished, and poor. That's what it says. In, they lived in danger, threatened with death. Some of them are actually dying. But he says, even though these things are happening, we're not praying them away. They're actually happening. Yet, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ. He, he's not saying, let's, let's, let's pray this stuff away. Speak life into this thing and, and call those things that aren't into, into being and, and help me. My life sucks. I need help. 
He's like, no, we're not doing that. We're staying in the persecution. We're rejoicing in the suffering. And we know that Christ has our back. And if, they, if I live, it's for him. If I die, I'll be with him. Nothing can stop me. I, even though I die, I live. That's victory. That's victory. Someone should be happy in this place, right? That's the truth. That's overwhelming victory, not the gaining of stuff. Christian teaching that pursues worldly desires. You saw them there in 1 John chapter 2, worldly desires. And so Christian teaching that pursues worldly desire and gain isn't Christian at all. Listen, it wasn't but a few months ago that some people in this church came to me and said, listen, you remember when, you know all the new equipment that we got? Remember all the new equipment we got, right? That was awesome, right? And I stood up before you guys and I said things like, Listen, I know we're, not a, we're kind of a poor bunch. We don't have the money to buy all that stuff. But, uh, you know, we're just going to pray that somehow, and, and that whole thing happened with the church up north, and they gave us our stuff. Remember, I, I don't know if you were here when I said that a couple times. And so I had somebody in the church come to me as like a representative of a certain group at the church. And they said, listen, people aren't willing to, they don't want to sow their seed into this soil because they don't think it's a good soil to sow their seed into. Because you stood up and you told us that we were poor and you spoke death over this, economic death over this church. And that's not helpful. You need to speak life over them. Ever since then, that whole group is now gone. But let me remind you of something. He said, we have a perfect ministry. No one can find fault, Paul said. And listen, we are destitute. We are poor, we are hungry, and we own nothing. And he said, when I, when I say these things to you, I don't cause a single person to stumble. Now, if the Apostle Paul could say it, why can't I? This is the crap, pardon me, but this is the crap that permeates the church. And I love you guys, and I don't want you to have ears. Don't give it an audience another day. Don't give it a, a, an audience for a day. And I was thinking about this, you know, power in the tongue, and you can create and speak life into all these things, and I'm thinking about all that teaching, and I'm thinking about all these apostles in light of that teaching, and I'm thinking, like, if the biblical teaching is that we, could, we have such authority and power in our tongue that we could speak such change into circumstances, why didn't they? Right? Why didn't they? And, I mean, did they miss this? Is this a, oh, this must be part of the new revelation that we need to get. Because the old revelation's not clear enough. Maybe the apostles didn't understand that they could speak life into situations and make things that aren't as if they are. Maybe they missed out things that are taught as christianity that are actually of the world are false teaching okay they're not biblical teaching and so false teaching of course comes from false prophets four or five there are many false prophets in this world in other words they're not speaking by the spirit but again i just want to say that i don't know that everyone is intentionally evil i think people just get off track and they miss the mark, or they're immersed in that type of, pardon me, theology for so long, they don't even know how to get out of it if they tried. So, um, I think that a lot of people are just, what the scriptures would actually say here, at the end of our reading, he says, you'll know whether you have the spirit of truth or the spirit of deception. I just think people have been deceived. It's, it's not that they're... It's not that they're dumb. It's not that they're not nice. It's not that they're not good people. I just think that we're deceived. Remember Adam and Eve? I mean, Eve was just deceived. Like, just a little twist, right? Just a little twist. Just a little twist to the word. And she was deceived. She was, you know, she's probably a good woman, right? She was just deceived. And a lot of us are just deceived. And so listen, here's the best advice that I could possibly give to you, okay, on how to be informed. Where are the correct sources? What's the best way to be spiritually formed so that you can have your eternity really set and secure, okay? I want to give you this 
advice. Do me a favor and turn to the book of Acts, chapter 17. This is the best advice I could possibly give you as a shepherd that's been assigned to care for you. Acts chapter 17, look at verse 10, 11, and 12, okay? Just let me know when you're there. It's like super important, so please look. Acts 17, chapter 10, Paul again, right? He says, that very night the believers sent Paul and Silas to Berea, when they arrived there, they went to the Jewish synagogue, and the people of Berea were more open-minded than those in Thessalonica, and they listened eagerly to Paul's message, right? So that's a message for you guys. When you come to church, you should be listening eagerly to my message. Not that I'm some awesome thing, but you should, be listen, you should listen eagerly because you want to learn who God is, right? But listen, not just listening eagerly to learn... It says here, they searched the scriptures day after day to see if Paul and Silas were teaching the truth. Bam! That's it right there. Anyone who's a good teacher should be humble enough to say, I'm not the shepherd. Jesus is. Here's his word. No matter what comes out of my mouth, you should bring a notebook to church. You should write this stuff down. And then every day when you come in here, you should go back on Sunday or Monday and check every single thing that I ever say. Everything that I say. So does it say, don't listen to a bunch of teachers? It doesn't say that. It says, actually, you, could, you should listen to the teacher. But when you do, you still need to check what he's saying to see if it is true. If your eternity is in the balance, don't you think it's important enough? If I stand up here and say, Jessica, thus saith the Lord, you can listen. Listen eagerly, like it says. But then you should go home and check your Bible. Don't just take my word for it. Not everybody is speaking by the Spirit. Not everyone is speaking by the Spirit. So we should listen to teachers, but a good teacher should be willing to say, I'm humble enough to say, I might be wrong here, so please go home and check your Bible. And also a good teacher would be someone having checked that they are biblically sound. That they're actually telling you what this book is saying. Why would the Bible say that if it wasn't to encourage you to do the same? Now listen, this is the Apostle Paul. I'm teaching you the Apostle Paul's words. He is, the, I mean, he's even being questioned. I'm secondhand, right? I'm just telling you what he said. He himself is being questioned, and God is authorizing questioning, question the author. And so you should do the same thing. It's all over the Bible, all over the Bible about studying the, the Bible itself. Joshua chapter 1, study the word continually and meditate on it day and night. So it must be important, right? Um, 2 Timothy 2.15, I learned this one in the King James. It says, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. He's, listen, don't just read, right? He didn't say, hey, read your Bible. What does he say? Study it. Study it, right? Rip the truth out of that thing. Don't just read it. Don't just hear it. Study it, right? And he says, a workman. What does that mean? Work at it, man. I've said this before. How many, this is going to like make everyone feel guilty, but how many people in here work 40 hours a week right now at least? Okay. That's awesome. You should, right? Make some money. But here it says to work at studying the Word of God. How many people in here are studying the Word of God 40 hours a week? Raise your hand. Yeah, right? Yeah, I'm not. I'm probably 15 to 20. But this is what I do, right? I'm slack. But he says, study it. Be a workman. Work at that thing, right? Why, why, why is Joshua telling you to study it continually? Why is he saying meditate on it day and night? Why is God saying through Paul to Timothy to study, to show yourself approved, and work at that thing? You know why? Here's why. 
you know if I'm speaking for God? Or do you just show up here every week because I'm fun? How would you know? See, I don't take this stuff lightly. I have to, t- I have to give an account to the Lord. But listen, you do too. You have some decisions to make, right? And if you're sitting here in this pasture every week, you should know if I'm actually speaking for the Lord or not. And how would you know that? Other than, man, we're buddies, right? We're buddies, so man, I wouldn't steer you wrong, right? Tell that to the last guy that screwed you. Right? Let's be honest. So how would you know? You know because you study. You know because you study. God's word should be your greatest source of spiritual formation. An authentic Christian prophets or ones with a prophetic ministry should teach the Bible, not some twisted, convoluted set of ideas that cater to our worldly cravings, okay? So, so listen, as your shepherd, I would just say that the greenest pasture I could take you to is right here in your hand. That's my job, okay? That's why we say here all the time, open it, read it, and do it. That's your thing, right? But listen, when you come here to listen to me, be like, be like the people that came to Paul. Not just yourself open it, read it, do it, but when you come to listen to a man of God, you should expect this. That's what you should expect. You don't need my opinion. You don't need my stories. You don't need my nothing. What you need is for me to open my mouth and say, open your Bible to this. Let's study this thing. That's what you need, okay? That's what you need. Your identity and your purpose and your eternity is on the line. I can't stress that enough, of the importance of being a scholar of this book. Churches have it wrong. I'm the scholar and you guys are the... Apprentices, right? That's the way it is in church, isn't it? It's not supposed to be that way. There should be people in this room right now that have a greater ability to divide this than me. I'm just one man doing my job, and don't think that just because I spend 20 hours a week studying this to prepare to speak to you that you've done your job. You have not. He says to study to show yourself approved. A workman, a workman, you dig out truth so you can make your decisions. So listen, you want to know the goal of this message? And the goal, this this might not make you mad, but the goal that I have for tonight and the goal that I have every single week, you know what my goal is? To ruffle your spiritual feathers enough to make you go home and pick up that old dusty book. I love telling you stuff that nobody else tells you. I love telling you stuff that goes contrary to all this denominational stuff. And I don't even care if you believe me. If I, I'm, I'm going to go offline. If I could piss you off enough to make you pick up that book and find out the truth for yourself, then I did my job. And Jay agrees. We've talked about it. That's what we want to do here every single week. I don't need you coming in here and saying amen to every single thing I say. I want you to go, he's crazy. I want you to go home and with everything you have, you come back here and prove me wrong. You prove me wrong. And if you prove me wrong, I'll say I'm sorry from that pulpit. But I don't want you to just lay down. We used to say when when I was in the car business, we'd call the old folks who come in from the villages that didn't know anything, we'd call them Larry and Louise lay down. They'd walk in, they'd go, how much is that car? 32.5, okay. Don't be them. Don't be them. Don't take my word for it that lightly. I want to challenge you, and I want to make you go home and dig out of that Bible, and I need you to find out if what I'm sharing with you tonight is true, okay? That's what I want. Would you do that? Would you do that? Would you do that? I'm not asking into the wind. Would you do that? Yeah. <laughs> awesome, awesome. All right, let's, do, let's, 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 um, let's take a few moments, and, and we'll pray. And we'll, we'll receive our offering. We'll do all that kind of good stuff. And then we're going to, listen, this is not a hooray message, right? I, I told you it was going to be some hooray message. It's going to make you dance and sing before Jesus. But man, we got some amazing music coming up. And these, these songs will, will just stir your heart up again for Jesus. I know it. I know it. I know it. And I want you to fall in love with him. And I want you to know him. 
and I want you to serve him, and I want you to share him with people, and that's what's going to happen. I'm telling you, these next couple songs, it's only like 10 minutes, and give him that time. It's going to be an awesome experience between you and the Lord, and we always say here that we don't want you to, to come in and, and learn about Jesus. We want you to have an experience with him, and so that's our endeavor here when we gather here at Revolution Church. That's part of the sudden and momentous shift in the status quo that is our name. So, Father, we, uh, we thank you for your precious word. And Lord, I, I, I just, we're just reminded that you said we should tremble at your word. We should tremble at your word. And I, Lord, I don't think there's enough trembling in your people. And, and, and so, Lord, I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to say anything, fan. I just, I pray, Lord, that you will, will stir something afresh in the people that are hearing this right now, and, and maybe even those that are on Facebook watching right now, or, or whoever will in the next coming weeks and months, Lord, that you would stir something fresh inside of these people that desires only the authentic, only the real. Lord, that we would be able to, to parse between, between truth and, and false and, and fiction and nonfiction and real and, and, and there's just so much in the church and people are being taught all these worldly things and that is not what you wanted. I'm convinced, Lord, that overwhelming victory is when we finally get to the place in our life that we don't care what happens that we are utterly dependent upon you. you you're, one of the overarching themes in all of Scripture is that you want us to be humble before you. That you're here and we're way down here. You want us to be dependent upon you. Your word says that you know all that we need, not our cravings, what we need. And if we would seek first your kingdom and your righteousness, all those needs would be given. You want us to be humble before you, Lord. And so, Lord, instead of us trying to grab hold of all these worldly desires of wealth and stuff and promotion and, and, and even deliverance from affliction, help us to rejoice, like your word would say. Help us to rejoice in the suffering. Because that's when we're the most like Jesus. Father, I'm convinced that people in this world need to hear this. And you've chosen our church to deliver this message. Lord, would you help us to partner with you to advance this message to as many people as possible. And that's how we give. We give for that. So Father, I would ask that um, you would speak to your people and let them know what giving looks like for them, not out of habit, not being pushed or persuaded, not out of tradition, but right here, right now, that you would talk to your people and tell them what thanksgiving looks like. Tell them what generosity looks like and what partnering with you looks like for them. And give them the ability to just heed your voice and give according to what you say.